but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes again from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. It can be found on page 44 in the Red Pew Bible of the New Testament. Mark 8, 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Many, 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 well, at least three decades ago, I was an undergraduate student at the University of California in the forestry department. And one of the most important things that you, usually, that you had to do was to make sure you had a summer job secured. Everybody was trying to find summer jobs to make sure that they can, uh, one, get experience, and then also earn a little bit while we were students. So I went and spoke to one, there was a, a, a position that one of my professors was offering, a research assistant to work with one of his grad students on a project. I said, okay, that sounded like a good, you know, it was in the field, you know, in, it was in my field. And so I met with him, we talked all about the, the technical aspects of this research that this grad student was trying to do for their um, dissertation. It was, had to do with, developing a model to um, predict tree growth. I said, oh yeah, it's really fascinating. He went through all the details of it. And then right before I left his office, he said, oh, one more thing. You know, you'll even get a chance to learn how to do some technical tree climbing as part of your job. I thought, oh, okay, sounds interesting. And then I never thought about it again. You know, he said, okay, well, you have the job and we'll talk to you when June comes around. All right, never thought about it again. Summer came, we headed north. The job was up near Mendocino County, Fort Bragg. And as it turned out, once we got there, the job entailed basically 
taking, they're trying to um, put together a predictive model about growth. So it's basically, they wanted to figure out if there was a relationship between um, tree growth, the rate of tree growth, and the leaf surface area of a tree, of a whole tree. I said, okay, how are we gonna do that? Well, it turns out um, my job did include tree climbing. <laughs> And that's all I did all summer. It turned out that was the, the primary job. And I was a little angry with the professor because he really wasn't upfront about it when he kind of threw that in kind of at the last minute after we talked about it. So the interesting thing about, so we were working with, we were, we were supposed to DLM two redwood trees. They were like 120 feet tall each. That was the job for the summer so they could get the branches measure the leaf surface area. I had never done this before. They got some people to train us. And the one thing that I learned and I still think about today is, well, one, how frightened I was being up on a tree all summer, but um, how counterintuitive that kind of tree climbing is. So redwood trees, right, they're not like trees you may have climbed when you were a kid where branches were spread out and, you know, you can find your way up. You know, it's, the redwood tree is one single stem and smaller branches coming up all the way, not really big ones that you can actually climb on. So we were using ropes and, you know, you've seen PG&E linemen on poles, right? So that's how we were getting up these trees. And as we were going up, cutting off each branch at a time. And it was so counterintuitive because when you're up there, as you get higher and higher and higher, the closer and closer you wanted to stay to the trunk of that tree. I mean, if you could get, if you could wrap your arms around it, that's, you would try to do that because you felt safer being connected to the stability of the tree. But all, it took me all summer to learn that that was just the opposite of what I needed to do to actually feel more relaxed up there, to be more efficient with my energy. You know, you were supposed to kind of lean back a little bit away from the tree trunk and let the ropes do a lot of work. Because when you're hugging the tree, your whole body is tense and you're using up a lot of energy. So all, it took me really literally all summer to finally figure it out that I need to go work against what my mind was telling me to do. My natural instinct was to just hold that tree as tight as I could, but then you, can't, you really can't move. And to, 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 to lean back and let the rope do the work. So that was an interesting job and um, forced me to learn the lesson and to fight against what I would naturally want to do or feel like was the safest thing. In this morning's passage, we're going to reflect upon the counterintuitive nature of the cross and the call to surrender. So the counterintuitive nature of the cross and the call to surrender our lives to Jesus. So right before the passage that we read in verses 29 and 30, Peter identified, this is the, um, the passage where Jesus asked, who do they say I am? Then he asked the disciples, who do you, who do you say I am? And Peter actually identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Which was kind of, which was a breakthrough, I think, because all through the narrative, right, the, the disciples had trouble answering these kind of qu these questions from Jesus. And they struggled just like any other human being. Um, but Peter, in this one passage in, in verses 29 and 30, he actually was able to say, you're the Messiah. So it felt like a, a huge breakthrough that Peter finally understood um, Jesus' identity and Jesus' purpose. So here in our passage that we read is when Jesus 
shared again clearly his what his call and purpose was on earth to die what to be persecuted to die on the cross and then resurrect three days later that amazing thing happened peter really i guess displayed what his true understanding was i mean he turned and rebuked rebuked jesus which when you really stop and think about it, it's an amazing kind of ostentatious position to take as one of Jesus's closest disciples but he almost he almost steps into this role of authority over Jesus by wanting to rebuke him and I'm guessing wanting to correct Jesus on well I'm not sure if that is really what your calling is supposed to be about Jesus the whole dying we don't like that Right, and at the time, they were all looking for a powerful king to come overthrow the, the powers that be in the, in, the Roman, in the Roman culture. But Jesus was, was sharing just the opposite of what, again, he's done, he's said, he has said this before, earlier on at his ministry, so he's repeating himself again that this is my call. So it, it's, it's amazing. This, this pathway that Jesus has clearly explained just doesn't make any sense to Peter. And you, th you know, I think about G Peter wants to hug the tree. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to surrender by leaning back and doing exactly what Jesus is instructing him to do. Richard Horsley writes, disciples are not to guide, protect, or possess Jesus. They are to follow him. And, and that's exactly what Peter, in his rebuke of Jesus, is trying to step in and say, let me show you, Jesus, what, how you're wrong and what you're, and what you're saying about your life. Let me read that again. Disciples are not to guide, protect, or possess Jesus. They are to follow him. So when Peter tries to rebuke Jesus, what does Jesus do? He comes right back, and Jesus responds by rebuking Peter and the disciples. Get behind me, Satan. Very powerful words. I think it, it exemplifies Jesus' frustration, uh, maybe nearing his, his limit on patience, because he's done this over and over, trying to teach and correct and remind his disciples of what his life is about. You know, Jesus displays an amazing, throughout his life, an amazing level of patience, but displaying his unchanging nature. I think that's something that um, it is helpful to all of us. Um, in Hebrews 13, 8, it reminds us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're so thankful for that. I think Peter and the disciples as well that despite the mistakes that the disciples were making or questioning, questioning Christ, Jesus continued to teach. So at this point, you know, Jesus, after he rebukes Peter, he gathers his disciples and also the surrounding crowd and begins to expand further on this counterintuitive counter nature of the cross. Verse 35, to save your life, you must lose it. If you lose your life, you will save it. Now Jesus, I mean, he could be speaking about a literal death, like the one he, he'd be facing soon. But I think he, more importantly, is speaking about our lives today, here on earth, and how, and how we live it. 
Our world is driven to accomplish, accumulate, build uh, wealth and status in order to stay ahead. We live in a culture that encourages or maybe even demands one to depend upon ourselves to earn everything we have or want. What Jesus is trying to show the disciples is the counterintuitive idea of surrender. Surrender. And we actually talked a little bit about surrender last week in our post-sermon discussion. In today's world, surrender is is not a positive word in our culture. Grant Faulkner writes, surrender is a word soaked with the negative connotations. To surrender is to be weak. You surrender when you have no more will to fight, when you lack strength, when you lack belief. Surrendering can seem like a character flaw especially in victory at any cost America. Never surrender, never give up. Persist, resist, insist. The counterintuitive nature of the cross tells us the exact opposite. If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is the call to surrender our lives, to turn away from our self-centeredness and to become fully committed to Jesus, both in what we proclaim, but more importantly, in how we actually live our lives. Lent is a season for repentance, a a turning away from those things that pull us away from God. But this turning away really only becomes complete when it results also in a turning towards. A turning towards Jesus. Turning towards the Jesus that embodies divine and unconditional love and offers it to us, each one of us. Let us surrender and make the counterintuitive move to turn towards Jesus during this Lenten season. Amen.
Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for leading us in worship today. Receive this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now go, love concretely, even when it's risky. Serve generously whoever has need and pursue God's restoring justice until it rolls down like waters in an ever-flowing stream. Amen.